Good morning and welcome to this, the first meeting of the Equality and uh, Human Rights Committee in 2018. Uh, can I make sure that all electronic devices are switched off and off the desks, please? Uh, we have apologies from our colleague Gail Ross this morning. Agenda item one is to take agenda item three and four in private. Our committee agreed to take agenda item three and four in private. Agreed. Thank you very much. Agenda item two is the Universal Periodic Review. Uh, we're taking oral evidence this morning from the Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance um, on the Scottish Government's response to the third Universal Periodic Review, or the UPR, as we may be calling it through the Committee um, on Human Rights in the UK. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Ms Constance this morning, and she is joined by Duncan Isles, who is the Head of Human Rights Policy at the Scottish Government and David Holmes, who is a human rights policy officer. Good morning and welcome to committee. Um, this is the first time this committee has considered the Scottish Government's response to the UPR, and so our main focus will be to understand the process and the role of the key players in greater detail so that we can understand what the Parliament and the committee's role might be in future cycles. The Government's response covers a wide range of issues across many ministerial portfolios, and we realise the Cabinet Secretary and officials may not be in a position to respond immediately to any questions which fall outside her specific portfolio responsibility. We can, of course, follow up um, on any such issues via correspondence after the meeting, should this be required. Um, so before we move on to questions, Cabinet Secretary, um, I'd like to invite you to give us some opening remarks on your response to the UPR. Okay, thank you very much, Convener, and uh, good morning and Happy New Year to everyone. Um, as the, the Convener says, um, the topic at hand this morning um, is to give evidence in relation to the third Universal Periodic Review of the UK's human rights record and the Scottish Government's response to the UN Human Rights Council's uh, recommendations. The Universal Periodic Review is a, a peer review mechanism. It's coordinated by the, the UN Human Rights Council and it takes the form of a, a rolling review of the human rights records uh, of all UN member states uh, and results and formal recommendations uh, to the state under review. Uh, the UK's record has now been examined on three occasions in 2008, 2012 uh, and last year uh, 2017. The Scottish Government very much values the opportunity that the UPR presents for countries to set out the action they have uh, taken to fulfil uh, their international human rights obligations. In addition, it enables good practice to be shared and offers context within the civil society, uh, which civil society interests can raise awareness of human rights challenges and highlight issues of concern. So the UPR is a, a cyclical uh, process uh, with each cycle uh, running over a four to five year period. It is centred on a, a formal examination or uh, what's called an interactive uh, dialogue, which is held in Geneva uh, at the Human Rights Council. And this consists of a question and answer session uh, with the UN member state being able to make comments uh, and offer recommendations to the, the, the state under review. States submit a, a national report in advance of the dialogue. Uh, preparation of the UK report is uh, coordinated by the UK government uh, on behalf of the member state. The Scottish government actively contributes to that process and liaises very closely uh, with the Ministry of Justice uh, to ensure Scottish interests are represented. Uh, the most recent report to the Human Rights Council was submitted in February 2017 ahead of the May 2017 examination. Uh, national reports are, however, subject to a strict word limit and it is impossible in practice to include everything of relevance uh, in the final version uh, of the report. So, in order to ensure that a more detailed account of Scottish-specific issues and actions was made publicly available, uh, including for the benefit of Parliament and indeed domestic stakeholders, uh, the Scottish Government published its own position statement uh, in April 2017. And our intention is that the publication of Scottish specific statements uh, outlining compliance with human rights obligations in Scotland will become standard practice uh, for exercises such as the, the UPR. 
The UK received a total of 227 recommendations uh, from the UN Human Rights Council following last year's interactive dialogue. Uh, these covered both reserved and devolved matters, and prominent themes included violence against women and girls, hate crime, human trafficking, children's rights, uh, the rights of asylum seekers and refugees, and uh, the UK government's proposals to repeal the Human Rights Act. Many of these are areas in which the uh, Scottish Government is already taking positive action. However, there are also areas where we would acknowledge that further action is required. And there also uh, are areas where the powers necessary to fully implement treaty obligations are reserved to Westminster, for example, in relation to immigration and asylum. The UPR is, is not a flawless uh, process. Uh, relatively little attention was paid uh, in the UPR recommendations to issues that had been highlighted by UN human rights treaty monitoring bodies in recent reviews of the UK. For example, the impact of austerity measures and welfare reform policies uh, and action to realise the rights of people with disabilities. Uh, and these are all priority issues uh, for uh, the Scottish Government. The UK Government responded uh, formally uh, to the Human Rights Council at the end of August 2017, uh, indicating which recommendations the UK supports uh, and which recommendation it notes. Support for a recommendation indicates that a state intends to uh, take action to implement it. In total, the UK Government supported 96 of the 227 recommendations uh, and noted the remainder. The Scottish Government published its own separate response to the UPR recommendations on the 8th of December last year. Uh, the response provides a much fuller explanation of our position uh, in relation to each of uh, the recommendations. It also goes beyond the UPR recommendations to address many of the issues noted by UN treaty monitoring bodies in recent years, but which were not explicitly covered uh, by the, the UPR. And throughout the, the UPR process, we've sought to engage actively uh, with our civil society stakeholders. Uh, stakeholder meetings were held on the 27th of October 2016, 25th of April 2017, and the 12th of June 2017. And we've been very clear in our support uh, for direct uh, civil society engagement with the UN Human Rights Council uh, and national delegations. So, convener, I hope that this overview of an engagement uh, with the UPR has provided uh, a helpful insight into key aspects of the process and our intentions uh, for the future. Uh, I very much welcome further exploration of how the Government and Parliament can work uh, together to engage with the UPR process in a way uh, that leads to improvements in how the people of Scotland enjoy their human rights uh, on a, a very practical and day-to-day -day basis. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And, uh, my colleagues have got lots of questions in all of those areas to, to, to come back and speak to you about. But I, I want to open uh, with um, a question on the Scottish National Action Plan. And you've said that the, the norm from now on will be a Scottish distinct Scottish response to, to any of the, the reviews that, that come up. How do you think the action plan, now it's a couple of years in, um, I was at an event in December where the Scottish Human Rights Commission were doing a review of the action plan. Now that it's a couple of years in, how do you think the action plan can then be used to ensure that we do, do that, give that distinct response, but we are making progress? Yeah, so, uh, the Scottish Na National uh, Action Plan is very important. It's an area where uh, Scotland as a nation um, and as, as a civic society has shown, uh, I believe, uh, great leadership and commitment uh, to the practical implementation uh, of human rights in a way that is meaningful. It's very important to stress that um, the Scottish National Action Plan is not, doesn't belong to the Scottish Government. Uh, it's a process in which we cooperate uh, with the Scottish uh, Human Rights Council uh, and our other uh, partners across you know, the public, private uh, and uh, third uh, sector. But we obviously contribute uh, to that work. I'm very pleased that you um, attended you know, that event, uh, convener, in, in December. Uh, that event uh, was uh, led uh, by the Scottish Human Rights Council. Um, and it was held as a, as a national uh, participation uh, event. So, you know, we uh, have offered and will offer to support 
um, the, the Scottish Human Rights uh, Commission and other partners in terms of, you know, support maybe around, um, you know, uh, improvement in terms of using the um, improvement services and improvement uh, me me methodologies. Um, so it's a process we don't wholly own, but it's a, a process that we're absolutely committed to, uh, and it's a process that we want to. Um, uh, utilise to best effect so that it can help make human rights real in Scotland. Yeah, that, that, that sort of leads very nicely into the, the next question. It was an incredibly well attended uh, event and from people from lots of uh, statutory uh, bodies and social work and social care, but also smaller organisations, um, third sector and just ordinary people. There was lots of people listed as just an interested person. And if we really make, uh, attempt to make human rights real for people, they need to know in which areas of their life that human rights uh, make that difference. And for a lot of people, they see the headline grabbing things but they don't see you know the stories of how you can use human rights to realize better social care or use human rights you know to, to maybe push along a judicial situation that, you, that you're involved in um, and that you know participation from ordinary folk and organizations in, is incredibly important what other measures has the government taken to ensure that 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 level of engagement continues and, and increases so, I mean, this takes me back to uh, some important points of process um, around the, the, the UPR process. So, um, that in itself is a process uh, that supports participation engagement uh, from our national human rights uh, institutions, uh, which obviously the Scottish Human Rights Commission and the Equality Human Rights Commission uh, are, um, I think the correct word, are, you know, accredited national human rights uh, institutions who actually have speaking rights, um, UN monitoring bodies in the, in the UPR are, are process. And that's a great um, opportunity um, and it's um, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why we publish our own Scottish-specific reports in advance of the interactive dialogue and why we publish our own Scottish-specific reports um, in response uh, to the UN Council recommendations is that it enables uh, that uh, very focused scrutiny uh, from organisations uh, and other civic organisations, uh, you know, like the Scottish Human Rights Commission, Equality Human Rights Commission uh, and, and other um, uh, organisations in, in civic Scotland. Um, so they're able to, to see you know, so we're not just submitting information to the UK government for them to um, reflect in a partial way the, the Scottish position. So we're going um, above and beyond, you know, producing full reports. Um, that full uh, report, that the Scottish report, um, is available in advance of the interactive dialogue, which gives um, our civic organisations the opportunities to be reading that report, reflecting on it, to be coordinating their response and making their own reputa uh, representations uh, to, uh, in this instance, in terms of the UPR process, uh, the United Nations Human Rights uh, Committee. And that gives a great um, experience, international experience, uh, for our uh, you know, national human rights organisations uh, and also, I think, promotes uh, great capacity building uh, within um, you know, not just you know the big, bigger uh, national human rights institutions in, in Scotland, but also some of those smaller stakeholder groups too. Thank you very much, um, <coughs> Alec Hamilton. Thank you, convener. Good morning, cabinet secretary, and, and to your officials. Um, I think it's fair to say that, uh, or I should remind the committee, obviously, of my former membership of the SNAP leadership panel, and also as convener of the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights. Uh, it's fair to say, I think that. Um, one of the problems with the UPR process is that state parties, when they submit reports, give a, a fairly glossy varnish of their own records. Effectively, they're submitting their own human rights CV. They put their sort of uh, successes and pro uh, progressive activities to the fore and don't really talk about the bits where they have fallibility. I, I think with the best will in the world, that could be said of, of the Scottish government's own reports that we, we would want to talk about where we were excelling um, in, in terms of human rights delivery and not necessarily in, in the areas we're far behind. Um, in 2017, last year in June, a panel discussion, um, uh, Hakim Benchamarka from Morocco 
um, suggested that parliaments should have a role in this as well, and that reporting by parliaments to the UPR process um, should be considered as a, a mainstream sort of uh, vehicle into that process. There, that way, in parliaments, not just in terms of the state party, but of devolved administrations within the state party, could act as a critical friend to the activities of the state party, but also within their own devolved administration, could be a counterpoint to the reports published uh, by, for example, the Scottish Government, um, and, and I give examples of where we might have fed from this committee into that. In our um, inquiry around destitution of asylum seekers, we found some uh, significant problems with UK immigration policy, which affected um, the, the life circumstances of people seeking asylum in this country, and we would have wanted to feed that into the UPR process. Um, do you think, uh, would you support a parliamentary process to feed in a sort of neutral report or a, a, um, a non-partisan um, report on behalf of the parliament, which would act as a counterpoint to the own Sc the Scottish Government report you've already described? So, I suppose that's the role of the... Um national human rights uh, institutions so we publish you know transparently um, our report um, our report in advance of an active dialogue i would contend um, is uh, an accurate reflection of you know our current policy uh, and legislation and the whole purpose of the upr is it's a cyclical uh, process about continuous improvement so you know we're not suggesting that you know um everything's a done job or, or everything's perfect or there isn't you know that need for um, um, continuous improvement. So in publishing, um, I mean, we don't have to publish um, a, a, a Scottish-specific report, but we do, uh, recognising um, that with the best will in the world, uh, there is a word limit for the, the UK report. We are, you know, one part um, of the UK. Um, we want to show that full range of positions in progress or need for further action um, in, in, in Scotland. Um, and with the best will in the world, that, that won't necessarily be reflected within a UK uh, report, just given word limits, etc. So we are, you know, already as a government going above and beyond in terms of what we have to do. We're not taking a minimalist um, approach. And then obviously in terms of the national human rights institutions, you know, they have an opportunity uh, and indeed a responsibility to scrutinise that and come to a view. I am very supportive uh, of Parliament uh, taking an enhanced role. I suppose I'm somewhat conscious, is it really for government and for government ministers to be, um, I, I suppose, uh, telling Parliament how to scrutinise uh, government? So I, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm being a little bit uh, delicate about that because I think that would uh, annoy the parliamentary authorities and indeed parliamentarians uh, if it's government ministers that are preaching, you know, how that, that should be done. Um, but if I can say in broad levels, um, I'm very supportive uh, of the role of Parliament in that regard. Uh, I think there are existing opportunities, uh, you know, as a government, we are open to further parliamentary uh, opportunities in terms of scrutinising um, how we feed into the process, in terms of scrutinising what we prepare uh, for the process. And then I think, you know, crucially, um, you know, coming uh, to a, a view uh, as a parliament in terms of where our priorities and, and where we want to give uh, further impetus. I'm also conscious that the Commission for Parliamentary Reform um, had uh, also ruminated on the role of Parliament as a, a guarantor, if you like, uh, of, of human rights and had made some recommendations uh, for, uh, you know, this committee in particular. I suppose one of my reflections is that the benefit of increased parliamentary involvement and scrutiny uh, would be that um, it would help mainstream the work in this area, and I'm sure this is this is something that I contend with, um, given my particular portfolio responsibilities. I'm sure this committee contends with it as well that we we don't want you know human rights or equality to be seen to be the province of one committee uh, or one portfolio. It has to be mainstreamed uh, throughout government and throughout parliament. So, um, you know, I appreciate that was quite a, a long answer, Mr. Cole Hamilton. It was a long question, um, but um, I'm, you know, would be very supportive of that direction of travel. Thanks. 
Thank you for that answer. Um, I, I, I congratulate the Scottish Government um, for producing the report. Not all sort of devolved um, governments within state parties do that, so uh, I think it's to be commended. Um, I, I guess my question stems from that reality that um, increasingly Parliament is being looked to, not just in Scotland, but Parliaments across the world are being looked to as guarantors of human rights in their jurisdictions, um, particularly as they act as naturally a check on the, the work of the executive of government. Um, so to that end, I feel that uh, there is a missing piece of the jigsaw in the UPR process then. If we are to be the guarantor of human rights, um, we can't just have the Scottish Government prepare a rep its own report on the UPR and then let the human rights institutions act as a critical friend to that and, and challenge that or, or, or seek to mould that. So my question would be, um, I, I, for one, would like this committee at least to have a role in the preparation of that report and scrutiny of that report in future uh, UPRs. Would that be possible? Well, it's entirely up to the committee what the committee thinks is possible. You know, so it's entirely you know open to the committee to be, um, you know, whether it's the UPR process uh, or whether it's our involvement in other um, monitoring processes around other uh, international uh, treaties. Because the process that we take to participate in the UPR in terms of providing information to the UK government uh, for the, the UPR process is one that we, we, we undertake uh, for other monitoring scrutiny of other international treaties that the UK uh, has, has, has signed up to. So uh, it would appear to me entirely reasonable, you know, if in, in advance of, um, you know, uh, this government preparing, you know, our specific Scottish reports that if the um, committee was doing a call for evidence or, uh, like you are today, calling um, you know, ministers uh, to uh, account, you know, that I, I would expect there would be you know, opportunities for the committee um, you know, before and after the preparation of reports to be looking at that further. It will, of course, I think, require government to um, perhaps give you some advance warning about timescales uh, and, and, and the frameworks. Um, so, yeah, and I, mean, I, you know, I, I would never... Um, uh, be, be adver adverse to that, far, far from it. I think the point about the role of parliaments is uh, important given that actually we all have a role to play and you know, we, we, we speak a lot as a government that this you know, is a core responsibility for government, but it's not government's job alone. It's not something you know, government can, can achieve alone. So you know, if there's an enhanced role for parliament, um, I'm, I'm sure that would be welcome. I'm sure it'd be welcomed by stakeholders, not my job to speak on behalf of stakeholders. But. And final question on this, and then I'll give my time over to others and come back in later if I may, Convener. Um, in respect of the reports that we produce now, the Scottish specific reports, um, how much of that is at it, acting as a critical friend to the UK government in respect of reserved powers, particularly, for example, on the rights of asylum seekers who um, end up in Scotland, who find themselves destitute or whatever, um, and how much of it uh, is sort of, I suppose, introspective about where uh, we are falling short in terms of our human rights obligations? I suppose it's uh, a, a report fulfils uh, a number of functions. Um, I think that's quite a diplomatic way to put it, um, that we do, of course, you know, regularly um, and appropriately highlight different uh, policy positions uh, in both reserved and devolved uh, matters. Um, or differences um, in approach and opinion um, around you know, refugees and asylum seekers, I suppose, would be a very um, obvious um, example um, of that. Um, the purpose, I mean, wh where our report as an um, sort of state of the nation report, if you like, and then our response to the recommendations, I think where it's really useful is that it can act as a, a strategic overview, a strategic document. Uh, these are lengthy reports. Um, they are reports that provide a, a sort of go-to place, a go-to report in terms of looking um, at our overall work uh, in, in the one place. Um, I suppose they're a bit like uh, reference documents as well, uh, as well as, you know, um, 
trying to help with that process um, of reflection. I think it's the process in terms of participating um, in these reviews uh, and the debate and dialogue that goes on around that. Uh, that's the process that is reflective and helps uh, focus minds on further specifics and the further uh, de detailed actions. But you know, there are always ways, these are really lengthy reports, and I'm sure there are always ways um, to do them better. So I did say that was my last question, but actually just what you've said there is part to follow up, which is um, when we, you said earlier that um, the, the UPR conclusions uh, cover reserved and devolved areas. So those areas, the, the concluding observations of those uh, UPRs, um, when they cover Scottish devolved powers, what is the process for the government sort of ingesting them and dealing with them and finding a way um, to, to sort of make them good? So, uh, out of the 227 recommendations um, made by the, the, the UN Human uh, Rights Committee, um, around um, 100 or so of those were entirely reserved. Uh, so we can, of course, you know, ha have a view in these matters, but they're, they're entirely reserved. Um, other recommendations uh, are either devolved or are, are a mix between devolved and reserved. Some of those recommendations um, may also relate to devolved issues, but they're crafted in a UN context, uh, a UK context. So they're quite you know, we, we, in terms of the spirit of them, will be supportive, but how they're crafted or worded, you know, it, it may not be a simple uh, shift uh, and, and lift. Um, but I am pleased to say that, you know, um, I, I quoted um, earlier how, um, you know, the UK supports 42% um, of these 227 uh, recommendations. Uh, so when you strip out the recommendations that are uh, wholly reserved, um, the recommendations that we would be uh, supportive of, you know, would be much higher. It would be, you know, around 80%. Um, and then in terms of the other recommendations, um, you know, uh, where recommendations that the, the UK talks about noting, these are perhaps recommendations that are not necessarily rejected, but are, you know, supported uh, in part or are areas that further work needs to be done before you can come to a view or indeed see how you're going to enact uh, or, or, or accept. So it's, it's more of a, it is, I think it is important to um, emphasise that it is um, a reflective, considered process as opposed to, you know, a straight, you know, accept, reject um, of, of, of recommendations. But um, in our report, um, because we've tried to widen out the issues, and that was welcomed by the, the stakeholders, so there were intimated multiple remarks that there were um, issues that, um, in terms of the UN monitoring bodies, uh, of individual treaties. So, uh, you know, the United Nations uh, Committee on the Rights of People with Disabilities had came up with quite some very sharp critical views of the UK uh, government and, um, you know, around um, welfare reforms and the impact uh, on the rights of people with disabilities. So that wasn't encapsulated uh, in uh, the Universal Periodic Review. And there were some other areas uh, that were missing as well. So we've you know, in our response to the UPR recommendations, we've also looked at the um, uh, international treaties, the human rights monitoring uh, bodies' recommendations around the UK's uh, performance in international, the individual international treaties to give a more um, holistic response and a broader response and hopefully one with more, more depth. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Mary Fee. Thank you, um, convener, and, and good morning. There's, there's a couple of specific areas I, I would like to um, d discuss with you this morning, Cabinet Secretary. The first is the Istanbul Convention, because there is, there is a call for full ratification of the, the Istanbul Convention, and I know that's something that, that, that you fully support. And, and we have the Equally Safe strategy in here, which is up, up in Scotland, which has done a, a huge amount of work to eradicate violence um, against women and, and protect families. And I just wonder if you could perhaps update us on where we are with full ratification of the, the Istanbul Convention. So, obviously, it's only the UK government that can ratify 
Um, and uh, there was uh, legislation uh, successfully led by uh, Dr uh, Ailey Whiteford, uh, the former MP for uh, Banff and Buchan, and it was a huge uh, personal achievement for her that was, um, you know, had uh, great acclaim um, with uh, women's organisations in Scotland. It was a great, it was a great uh, moment and a, and a great um, achievement when the UK government, um, you know, supported her uh, private member's bill, and they've made that commitment to uh, ratify. So, in terms of uh, that bill at a UK level, um, what needs to happen is that the UK government needs to take action, um, and there are specific issues around extraterritorial jurisdictions that need to be resolved. Um, and um, I think that requires legislation, separate le legislation, or, or at least regulation. Um, and you know, once that's done, the UK government can move to to ratify. So I think. And I think it's a, a fair response that they need to take action to enable them to ratify, and that's the, 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 the proper um, sort of uh, process. In terms of uh, a Scottish context, uh, with an equally safe strategy and also uh, an equally safe delivery plan, um, we uh, have been long advocates of the Istanbul Convention, um, actually because um, there is a huge correlation uh, between our equally safe strategy and the Istanbul Convention, and we were very confident that the tie-in uh, was very strong uh, and, and very direct. And as a nation, you know, we were confident that it wouldn't take an awful lot more before Scotland, in practice, uh, was compliant with the, the, the Istanbul con con Convention. Um, and the, the, the issue that I think ne needs to be resolved, the, the primary issue that needs to be resolved to enable uh, ratification is, is around the extraterritorial uh, jurisdictions. Any idea when that issue will be resolved? I don't, I don't have a timetable for that, but we could follow that up with the UK uh, Yeah, because it would be helpful yeah. to know how, how far Indeed, along the, yeah. the, the road they have travelled. Yeah, and I think, convener, with respect, it would also be helpful uh, to know wh where it is in terms of uh, priorities, in terms of, you know, whether it requires legislation, uh, regulations, you know, in, in terms of the process through... Uh, the House of, of Commons, um, obviously, like most governments, they've got a number of uh, bills and legislation uh, to pursue. So it'd be good to know where, where it is in the priority list. I would hope that it was high up. So would I, yeah. Um, the, the other area I wanted to ask you about was the Roma integration strategy. Um, in, in, the report, um, in the report section on the United Kingdom's <clears throat> key steps, there's only one reference to Scotland. And that's the development of a housing strategy, um, which is backed by EU funds. But th there's also a recognition that, that different nations have to adopt different policies to implement the Roma integration strategy. Um, and, and across the UK, there are different approaches taken by the, the, the devolved governments. In Northern Ireland, they've done a number of different things um, towards integration of the, of the, the Roma. Um, there's a, an, an education programme, there's a provision of school uniform, there's um, new initiatives around gypsy traveller um, health and wellbeing, there's health support, um, th there's also mediation on housing issues in Northern Ireland. Um, in Wales, there's a grant um, for education for gypsy traveller children. Um, there's also revisions to health and homelessness around gypsy travellers. There's a Mobile Homes Travellers Act. Um, there's a proposal for a, strat a statutory duty on local authorities to provide housing. And I'm just keen to explore what more the Scottish Government could do, because clearly across the devolved nations, there is the opportunity to, to do more to improve the outcomes for gypsy travellers in the Roma. And I know it's something, again, that the, the Cabinet Secretary is keen to progress. Yeah, so, I mean, committee will be aware of the work that um, I'm going to lead uh, and progress around uh, the ministerial working group uh, that will involve a number of uh, Scottish government ministers that will meet throughout this year. Um, and uh, in all the areas that you've touched upon, we're absolutely determined to make process. Um, I think you're right. I think in terms of the, the UPR recommendations, um, there was uh, several recommendations uh, that did relate to uh, the, the gypsy traveller community. Um, indeed, in terms of integration strategies, uh, about strengthening and activating existing laws, um, e elaborating a, a general strategy and preventing all kinds um, of, of discrimination. 
And uh, these recommendations will certainly inform uh, the work of the Ministerial Working Group um, uh, directly um, as we proceed. Um, the committee might also be interested in that um, Lord Aberystwyth, uh, who is a UK minister, his responsibility for sort of community cohesion and interfaith uh, issues, uh, last year uh, convened uh, a Four Nations uh, group. Uh, this was before um, the, the general election uh, last year. And uh, so political representatives from you know, all the devolved administrations uh, got together with Lord Aberystwyth and we discussed you know, a number of issues in and around race, uh, gypsy travellers. Um, and when we met again uh, in Edinburgh, we looked at some interfaith work and again you know, discussed issues around uh, gypsy uh, travellers. So that has become quite a useful forum in terms of exchanging um, you know, experiences and best practice uh, at what the different uh, home nations across the UK are doing. Um, and I found that particularly useful uh, in relation to uh, issues around uh, how we could better support the Gypsy Traveller uh, community. Uh, so that body will meet again um, I th sometime in spring. I can't remember if it's March or April. Uh, and we're going to meet in Cardiff uh, this time. So I'm going to take that opportunity um, to have a much closer look uh, what the devolved administration in Wales is doing uh, around uh, gypsy travellers because they have some strands of work that are of particular interest. Uh, and while you can't necessarily, um, whether it's in a UK context or an international context, shift and lift what other countries are doing because systems and you know, legislation uh, in our instances is, is, is different, the legislative framework is different, but it is really important uh, to really look, uh, not, not to cherry pick, but to really look uh, and, and really learn from the experiences and practices uh, of other countries. And I think, given it's quite easy to do that, at, you know, um, across the home nations uh, at, at UK level, I'm really keen, you know, to take uh, the opportunities to do that. And obviously, we'll keep the committee informed, both of the work in terms of the ministerial working group, but you know, where there is uh, uh, interest in learning uh, from across the UK. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. And if I could, can I just ask one further um, question? There, there's, there's one other area I would just like to um, briefly ask you about, and that's about action that's been taken to improve prisoner safety. Now, I know um, you would automatically think prisoners, the justice sector would be looking at that, but there, there is quite a strong human rights element to the way people are... Um, detained um, in, in, prisoners, in, in prison. Um, there's, there's a whole range of issues around um, their safety and, and their, their human rights and what needs to be done to fully protect them. Can you give us a, a brief update on any work that's been done around that? Um, I can give you a brief um, update. I mean, obviously, it is in the... Um you know, the day-to-day -day work uh, of justice colleagues. Uh, and, uh, of course, I understand that the tone and tenor and resident detriment of uh, Ms Fee's question as a former prison social worker. So, um, you know, I get entirely that um, in terms of um, the impact the prison population has on people's um, care uh, and rehabilitation with the institutions. So prison population um, is, is fallen. We've had a period in Scotland where it continued to rise. Um, it's now uh, going uh, the, the other way, uh, and that has to be uh, welcome. There are obviously programme for government commitments around... Um, you know, which Parliament has still to uh, fully uh, consider. Uh, but we have programme for government commitments around the presumption against short uh, prison uh, sentences. There is obviously the important um, work that's been done in terms of a whole systems approach that has had uh, sparkling results in terms of reducing uh, offending amongst uh, young people and young offenders. I mean, the population um, of the Young Offenders Institution at Pullman um, I'm pleased to say it's much decreased because of the work around prevention um, and um, uh, you know, alternatives uh, to custody. Uh, and that, of course, has enabled, um, I suppose, more in-depth work in terms of the rehabilitation uh, of those young people that are indeed um, incarcerated. Mental health strategy uh, is very important in terms of our uh, prison uh, population. One of the things, uh, again, it's a, a personal reflection, I was very pleased uh, that this government took under, uh, I think, Mr McCaskill, uh, was that um, 
the uh, medical treatment uh, of prisoners and the, 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 the provision of medical treatment um, you know, is now delivered as part of uh, the NHS um, as opposed to a kind of contracting uh, arrangement. And I think that has to be uh, much welcomed. I mean, that's a, you know, a, an action that was taken a number of years ago, but I think that was a very important uh, step forward um, um, that uh, compares favourably uh, since uh, my days of working in the, the, the prison states. Um, and there's also, you know, the work in terms of, you know, the violence reduction strategy, um, where each prison has, has its own um, plan um, as well. Um, and the suicide prevention strategy uh, is very important for our, our prison uh, population as well. If you've ever worked in a prison um, and um, experienced the impact that a suicide has on the mental well-being of other prisoners and indeed staff uh, working on those institutions, never mind the devastating impact that it has uh, on, on, on families. These things always touch you uh, forever. So our suicide prevention strategy um, is um, particularly um, important. And I think there's a much, much greater awareness uh, at that corporate level of the Scottish Prison S uh, Service and indeed those uh, that are working on the front line uh, in our prisons about the importance and the relevance um, of putting human rights into practice as well and how that's actually good for our communities. It's good for the rehabilitation of offenders and it's therefore uh, good uh, for our communities and our national interest. Thank you for that very thorough answer. Okay, Mary. Thank you very much. David Thomas. Thank you for the moral cover secretary. Um, committees, the system across the parliament, um, human rights have a remit across all of them. Would the parliament consider training for staff and members to allow a greater understanding and scrutiny of human rights within the committee system? Well, I suppose that's obviously a question for the, 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 the Parliament, um, you know, whether that's the corporate body uh, or the presiding officer in terms of uh, training. I, uh, again, from a, a personal uh, perspective, um, you know, uh, wh when I was working uh, within the prison state, when I was working at the, the, the state hospital um, at, at Carstairs, it was at a time where there was, um, you know, growing recognition of the importance of human rights. It was at a time uh, when um, there was many tabloid articles about how all of this was nonsense and, you know, how it was going to lead to, you know, terrible um, outcomes. Uh, and I remember, uh, as a social worker, uh, undergoing training on the importance and relevance of human rights rights, as did other uh, hospital staff who were working at the state hospital uh, from other uh, disciplines as well. So I, I would testify to the importance uh, of training, uh, you know, for, you know, frontline professionals or, or frontline uh, staff as well. I, I do think it can have the uh, power to change people's practice and change their outlook. But I suppose with respect, that's ultimately um, a question for the parliament, but it, it would be one that I would uh, personally endorse. Thank you. David, Annie Wells. Convener, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I understand a new advisory board has been established on human rights. Um, and I was just wondering if the Cabinet Secretary could tell us what the makeup is of it and what the role is. Yes. Please. So, uh, part of um, the programme for government uh, for 2017 and 18, the First Minister uh, established an advisory group on human rights leadership. Uh, I think the L word, I think the leadership word, um, is uh, crucially important. Um, and colleagues might recall that the programme for government uh, spoke about how we need to be aspirational and ambitious uh, around our, our human rights obligations, you know, recognising that you know, I think we've got a good record uh, here in Scotland, but we're always uh, striving uh, to do more and actually to achieve more by, you know, working through, you know, some of the thorny issues and, and making sure things can actually be delivered and delivered um, in, in, in practice. Um, so as part of that, um, you know, manifesto commitment, programme for government commitment about giving uh, further and more meaningful effect, you know, for example, around economic, social and cultural rights. Um, the First Minister was very keen to establish um, a, a human rights leadership group. Uh, it's chaired by uh, Professor uh, Alan Miller, who will be well known uh, to this uh, committee. Um, there will also be a participatory process as, as part of that. Uh, so the, the committee, uh, that advisory group, uh, will oversee a participatory process, you know, involving you know various civic stakeholders, uh, and there's also um, a reference group um, 
of, of various you know, organisations with, with, with specialist input that will um, inform that, 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 that work. Um, and that group um, met for the first time yesterday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, before I go back to Alex, I wasn't, I'm not sure if you're wanting in with something yet. Yeah. Jamie Green. Thank you. Thank you, Kavira. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary and other guests, and Happy New Year. Um, just uh, to go back to some of the, the broader picture on next steps. Um, of the 227 recommendations uh, that were given, presumably they were given to the UK as the member state, <clears throat> but um, I think... Thanks to a previous question, uh, clarifications be given on how many of those are entirely reserved versus how many have either full competency uh, uh, under devolution or indeed are partially or shared competencies. Um, just looking through the list of some of the 12 key themes, there are obviously things which are, I think, clearly reserved, such as immigration policy, etc. But there are also lots uh, that are peppered through the, the guidance um, or, and the recommendations that are uh, clearly uh, devolved mm -hmm. matters, such as closing the equality gap employment, prison safety, guidance to schools, etc. How, one of the things I'm, I'm less sure about is how, if the um, UK government pursue a a specific route to address some of these recommendations, such as guidance to schools or, or, or justice, um, and the Scottish Government are perhaps addressing those recommendations in a different way, how that will be jointly reflected uh, in the next review period when all of that work combined has to go back to the UN to, I guess, address whether the, the, the Member State has uh, taken into account those recommendations. So I guess the question there is, um, how will the Scottish Government liaise both with the UN but on, uh, and also the UK Government to ensure that those joint efforts, whilst they may be different in their manifestations, are able to equally feed into the, the, the bigger picture? I mean, I, th I think, think that's a fair question. So if I just start with a bit about um, process from here to uh, the future, I should start by saying that we do uh, work uh, closely uh, and collaboratively with the Ministry of, of Justice in terms of the, the preparation uh, of the UK report. Um, and, you know, that's something there'll be a, a degree of to and fro uh, between um, our respective uh, officials on. So, you know, the UK government will prepare uh, their report. We'll have prepared um, our Scottish report. We will forward that to them. They will provide, you know, the, the UK report. We'll give comments on that from a Scottish perspective. Um, and then, you know, so, so it's a kind of iterative process. There'll be various uh, changes um, made. Um, and I'm just reflecting, and this absolutely isn't a, a political point, um, you know, with, with the best will in the world, uh, a UK report is not going to reflect everything from uh, a Scottish perspective. Hence, uh, we do our own uh, specific reports which don't go to the UN. Uh, the, it's, it's a UK report that goes to uh, the, the UN uh, for obvious uh, reasons, with the UK being the member state. Um, but our report, uh, as I indicated in my response to, to Mr Cole Hamilton, you know, can go to stakeholders, it can go, you know, it's available to parliamentarians, it's available uh, to uh, committees. So what, what will happen um, now, um, the, the UK government has said uh, that it will uh, later on this year respond to four or five of the recommendations. You know, it will give an, an update of where they are with four or five of the recommendations. I don't know which four or five recommendations they're going to focus on. There's also going to be um, a, a kind of midpoint review. Again, this is voluntary. Uh, UK government doesn't have to uh, participate in that, but uh, uh, has agreed that it will um, you know, provide um, a report at midpoint review that will encapsulate progress against uh, the recommendations. We will, of course, as we always do, will engage very closely. We will want to give fulsome information about Scotland and where we are in relation to uh, the recommendations. And, you know, we accept with the best one in the world, they're not going to you know, just cut and paste our report in its entirety. So we want to produce um, our own reports. We'll make sure that they are um, available to committee, um, you know, should you want to 
um, you know, uh, you know, pursue your own uh, deliberations um, about that. I, I would, given that we do have differences in some areas on, on approach, um, you know, we've got a uh, this government's um, hugely committed to the maintenance of the Human Rights Act. Um, we're uh, hugely committed to the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, which obviously has a, an impact on, you know, the Human Rights Act and indeed, you know, the, the, the Scotland Act. Um, so, in, in terms of human rights generally, I would contend we have a different approach, and that's before we even get into, I suppose, some specific policy matters. So, one of the things that we did, I, you know, put to the UK uh, government, that in terms of the UPR process, I actually felt a Scottish minister should be going with the UK minister uh, to, you know, you know represent uh, the UK, given that there are um, nuances and quite just different uh, approaches uh, in terms of this area. That was not something um, the UK government um, accepted. Um, you know, the, 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 the UPR process um, in terms of the interactive dialogue, it's a, a UK government minister. Uh, in this instance, it was Oliver it held um, ministry, one of the Ministry of Justice uh, ministers who was making the verbal representations, although it should be said uh, that Duncan Ells, uh, our head of human rights in Scotland and within the Scottish Government, uh, was there and that we had informed uh, the minister's um, um, briefing pack. But given that there are, and it's something that you know, I'll continue to pursue, um, I think uh, ministerial representation uh, from, from Scotland would be useful. We do it in other scenarios. Um, you know, there are times in previous portfolios uh, where I've went as a Scottish Government uh, Minister to, um, you know, European committees. You're there representing the UK, um, which you, you do, but it obviously gives you an opportunity to speak more fulsomely about, 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 the, about Scotland's position. I appreciate that answer. Do, do you get a feeling that actually the, the, some of the work that is done in Scotland uh, via the Scottish <coughs> Government could indeed assist the UK meet some of its obligations <coughs> in the recommendations? So, um, so in terms of the devolved settlement, so in terms of you know policy around things we've touched upon, you know gypsy travellers, prisons, um, housing, education, you know there are. Um, significant differences and then there are significant profound differences of opinions around immigration asylum and, and, and welfare reform but in terms of our you know notwithstanding these differences which of course we are within our rights to highlight in terms of our participation in the UPR process we are participating um, to um, demonstrate that at a UK level you know we're not responsible for all the UK performance, but um, we are, you know, the, the Scottish performance, I would contend, helps the UK demonstrate that we are, we are, are meeting our, our obligations, if I can put it like that. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Alex. Thank you, convener. Me again. Hello. Um, I, I think one of the most challenging conventions uh, that we as the UK State Party are signatory to and is the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And, and it's not just um, a reflection on UK or Scottish government policy. I think every state party in the United Nations finds this particularly difficult, um, particularly around capacity and supported decision making. Because effectively, the uh, Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities suggests that we tear up all of our capacity legislation and start again. Um, we have mental health tribunals where judges are routinely appointing curators to act for people who could make meaningful decisions, but it's easier sometimes just for them to do exactly that. And my question is, what steps are the government taking to review um, our capacity legislation and indeed the efforts we take to uh, support decision making for people who, who we have not previously credited with the capacity to be able to do so? Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to say that um, decision making and policy and practice around issues of capacity or incapacity uh, are, are, are quite challenging and, and always will be. So in terms of our um, existing legislation in and around the Adults with Incapacity Act, um, it is, um, you know, the legislation is based on principles. And in terms of practitioners, um, if you were taking action um, 
because it was a professional view that someone lacked capacity. You had to demonstrate throughout your you know, applications um, you know, to, you know, in the terms of the court process that you were applying these principles. So um, while I would say all legislation you know, needs to, to, to move on, um, in terms of the basis uh, of, uh, you know, for example, the adults with incapacity legislation, I think that that basis uh, of that legislation was to apply principles to actually at a rudimentary level to take a human rights approach um, and indeed to take a person-centred approach. Of course, that legislation is now uh, old. Um, there is a um, review um, around uh, adults with incapacity legislation and uh, that will be led um, by health ministers. There's also, um, in terms of the uh, most recent uh, Mental Health Act, uh, the uh, health ministers will be given some consideration uh, to issues uh, for people with autism and learning disability, whether the way in which the Act, uh, I suppose, articulates issues around, um, you know, mental disorder, you know, some of the definitions in the Act, um, you know, how the, the rights and needs and interests of people with learning disabilities and autism, you know, you know is, is, is the legislation best crafted to you know, um, accommodate that. So, you know, my, my knowledge of these legislation on a day-to-day -day basis um, is probably 10 years old now, but um, in terms of health ministers, they're actively, you know, looking um, at, at these processes. In terms of the, the broader points, in terms of how we meet our obligations, uh, both to the UPR process uh, and to, you know, the Convention on the, the, the Rights of People with Disabilities, um, where we have been able to demonstrate process, uh, progress in Scotland um, is uh, around the work we've done around um, the disability employment gap. Um, you know, First Minister and uh, Ms Freeman you know, have been active around an you know, unemployment summit. Uh, and also there is the um, disability um, fairness plan uh, in terms of Scotland. And that was crafted very much with a view to how we meet our international uh, treaty uh, obligations. And obviously, uh, Parliament, uh, Social Security Committee, I think in this instance, has taken a big interest uh, in the disability delivery plan. Thank you for that. And finally, for me, if I may convene, and you'd be disappointed if I didn't raise this, um, one of the, the aspects of the UPR is the, uh, was about access to justice. One of the uh, groups of people in our society who seldom mm. get access to justice are children. And that's because their rights aren't always enshrined in law in any way. And uh, this committee has actively called for this government to consider the full incorporation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. We were very gratified um, at the return from recess that this got the First Minister after the summer uh, signalled a willingness to consider this. Can the Cabinet Secretary give us some idea how that work is progressing and uh, what kind of timescale we're looking at for any uh, process behind that? So, uh, one of the, the reasons for setting up the First Minister's advisory group on human rights leadership uh, was indeed to consider uh, further issues uh, in and around uh, in incorporation. Uh, because what we want to do is we want to work through the issues uh, that need to be uh, worked through. I think it is um, all very well and un understand um, the raison d'etre and the desire uh, for people to say, you know, let's incorporate and let's incorporate now. Um, but in terms of a, a meaningful process that will result in a meaningful impact on the lives in this instance of children, there are issues that we need to work through uh, across the government uh, and the First Minister's advisory group uh, in part, I think, will help with that process. There was also work um, that has started, uh, again led by education uh, colleagues, in terms of an audit uh, around our compliance uh, with the UN Convention on, on the Rights of Child, which I think is, again, a, a useful process uh, to be embarked upon as well and will uh, give um, uh, focus, uh, uh, focus attentions on particular areas. And, of course, I'm glad that Mr Cole Hamilton welcomes uh, you know, the moves that were indicated in the programme for government uh, around uh, acceptance uh, of Mr Finney's uh, Member's Bill. And we are obviously in response 
uh, to uh, various scrutiny and international scrutiny processes. You know, we undertook very in-depth work about how we would go about raising the age of uh, uh, criminal responsibility, which I think is a demonstration of how, when you work collaboratively with the experts and the stakeholders, that you can work through the issues and we can get to a position where we can, you know, undertake action uh, that is uh, certainly, uh, you know, a step in the right direction. Great, thank you. Mary Fee, quick question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can, can I just ask um, what work has been done to monitor the effectiveness of anti-trafficking legislation? Uh, okay, so obviously we have particular uh, legislation um, in that area. Um, our um, uh, position and work on human trafficking actually as well as the work around female genital mutilation uh, was work uh, that Scotland was specifically mentioned on as part of the interactive uh, a, a dialogue. Um, so I think we should take some um, encouragement uh, from that, that there's a little bit of international recognition of the work uh, that we've done today uh, on uh, both FGM. I know that's something that um, Annie Wells has been um, you know, campaigning on, um, as well as our work um, around uh, human trafficking. And you have seen, um, I think, the very successful campaigns, again, led by justice colleagues, um, you know, that have been undertaken to inform uh, the public of um, the existence uh, of human trafficking and actually what to do in response to any concerns uh, that, that the public have. So, you know, there's a number of layers of how we, you know, monitor our progress. Um, you know, I suppose in terms of, you know, my portfolio, you know, we're looking at, you know, overall how we respond to our international obligations. And then, um, you know, bearing in mind that all committees and all portfolios uh, have human rights duties that are very specific responsibilities uh, for uh, justice ministers as well in terms of reviewing uh, or working in around human trafficking and indeed uh, the effectiveness um, of that. But I can get back to committee with if there are uh, specific actions uh, that justice uh, colleagues are looking at. Yeah, that, that would be helpful, just to see if there's anything that's been picked up and any changes that need to yeah. be made. That would be helpful. Yeah. I think the cross-party groups having a review with Scottish Government ministers anyway on, on the progress of the Human Trafficking Act and, and, and the, the, the value uh, and that it's created. Cabinet Secretary, I've got two final things for you before we can, we can, we can let you go. Um, we, we've covered quite a lot this morning, and if you look at um, the UPR recommendations, the concluding observations, not just from this cycle, but from the last cycle as well, and you look at how this Parliament and this Government has, has reacted to some of that uh, in legislation. So we are obviously building towards a social security system that's for people with disabilities, the Trafficking uh, Act, violence against women, climate change, uh, uh, the support of the Equal Protection Bill, John Finney's bill, all of that are pieces of legislation that we've brought in that are discreet to Scotland in that sense. And uh, I note the, the, the letter that we'll be discussing later from yourself, Cabinet Secretary, on the Child Poverty Bill. So we've, we've created legislation in these areas that, that hopefully will make things better and, and create some progress. How do you see the Child Poverty Bill addressing some of the specific recommendations in the UPR on uh, children and having the best life chances at the early stage? So, actually, I was very pleased that in the Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, uh, submission um, to the UPR process uh, that they said there have been some very positive developments. The Scottish Government has committed to reintroducing binding child poverty targets uh, after these were recently repealed uh, at, at Westminster. So, I was... I was um, uh, personally pleased that there was recognition of the importance uh, of the work uh, that, that I and my portfolio have led, but also uh, the, the, the unanimous position uh, of Parliament to uh, unanimously pass uh, our, our child poverty uh, legislation. In terms of where, where we're at um, just now, uh, our child poverty delivery plan uh, will have to be published. Our first child poverty delivery plan will be uh, a number of child poverty delivery plans uh, between now and 2030. But our first child poverty delivery plan will be published uh, in April uh, this year. Um, that uh, will be uh, very important in a number of regards um, in that it will have to show that uh, cross-government um, endeavour. It will be uh, informed uh, by the uh, advice 
of the Independent Poverty and Inequality uh, Commission. Uh, I'm absolutely sure there will be parliamentary uh, scrutiny uh, of our first uh, child poverty uh, delivery plan. So I suppose what I'm trying to see in terms of you know, participation, um, engagement, uh, accountability, um, that you know, the, the child poverty delivery plan you know, coming from our legislation um, and in terms of how it is brought together, um, I think will demonstrate how we're trying to make uh, the rights of children uh, to live free of poverty, how we're trying to, to make that real uh, and meaningful. OK, that, that's, that's helpful, uh, Cabinet Secretary. And finally, uh, we couldn't let you go with making some mention of the impact of Brexit. Uh, and specifically from a rights point of view. And we've talked now about pieces of legislation that the Scottish Government and this Parliament has brought about in order to fill gaps or, 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 or to have a discrete piece of legislation because we maybe want to go a bit further on, on something, especially on a, on a rights-based context. Would there be, given the, the, the amendment votes on the withdrawal bill the night before last, which put the ECHR in, a pretty precarious position and some of the other pronouncements around about um, human rights uh, policy generally, um, whether the Scottish Government would have any plans, uh, and, a few, and I know this is quite a, a question that is about the future plans, but would there be uh, future plans that the Scottish Government would consider to fill any policy gaps or um, uh, uh, rights gaps that would develop from withdrawal from the EU? Yeah, so uh, committee will be aware that you know our, our position is that uh, we don't want to see any uh, diminution um, of the rights that we currently enjoy as part of being uh, a member of the European uh, Union. Um, again, you know, part of the reason for the first minister establishing um, her advisory group on uh, leadership and human rights was to look at the point that you raise that in the context of Brexit. Um, how do we protect what we have and that there's no, no step backwards? But as well as, you know, uh, protecting, you know, how do we ex also extend uh, what, what we have? So, you know, while there'll be a job of work of there to do for, you know, a range of policy experts uh, and, and a range, full range of uh, government uh, ministers and, and cabinet secretaries, the First Minister's advisory group, uh, you know, will help us with that process about how, you know, given the uncharted waters um, of, of Brexit, you know, how do we protect uh, the rights that we all currently enjoy? And actually, you know, how do we continue on the road um, where we're aspirational uh, and uh, ambitious uh, as well uh, in terms of going further with our human rights obligations? Okay, I'm sure it's one we'll come, we'll come, come back to. I would imagine so. <laughs> Absolutely. Is there any final quick questions from colleagues? I actually think we, don't, we haven't exhausted all of the questions that we want to put to you, but, but maybe they're a bit wider than your portfolio, Cabinet Secretary. But we're very grateful for your participation this morning and for your answers, and there's many areas that I'm sure we will continue dialogue on, but we're yeah. very grateful for your participation. Okay, this thank morning. you very thank much. You thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, so... We are moving on to agenda item three, which we have agreed to take in private, so I now suspend committee.